Chita. 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 Ah, ah, ah. Chita is mind. Bodhicitta is like the mind focused on enlightenment. This extraordinary aspiration prayer whereby samsaric sentient ones cannot help but become Buddhas was spoken by the primordial Buddha Samantabhadra. Ho, oh, all that appears and exists, samsara and nirvana, is an illusory display of knowing or ignorance with one basis, two paths, and two fruits. So, A world, a world realm, can't arise from itself. There's three ways, or four ways things can arise. They can arise from themselves, they can arise from something other than themselves, from a combination of both, or uncaused. And absolutely nothing can arise like any of that. You logically follow it. Meaning, on the relative level, I'm looking at things through my karmic vision. And things appear to me as I'm ready and filtered to see. Same with everybody else. And very much dependent upon the realm. You know, I'm looking at this as a human. Um, our doggy friend is looking at this in a different way. A little different set of priorities. <laughs> In that sense, what we usually take for being real is a mistake. And over here, who I usually take myself to be is a case of mistaken identity. So, in that way, we say it is dreamlike and illusory. You can have a beautiful dream, you could have a terrible dream. They're both equally devoid of any reality value. So in this particular spiritual approach, in the Hinayana approach, they want to leave samsara behind and they strive for nirvana. That's essential. That is so important. You have this basis of renunciation and see the futility of trying to create happiness by manipulating your external environment, people and things. It doesn't work. How many times do I have to prove that to myself? That the happiness, the genuine happiness, comes from within. And when you find the contentment, the, the beautiful peace of mind that happens in meditation very spontaneously, there's this great happiness that happens of itself. No need for assembly not available in stores. <laughs> Batteries not included. It's natural. It's, it's why the kids have so much more fun than us. In this path, we go even beyond the nirvana fixation. We say the nirvana state is experienced by your mind. The samsaric state is also a mentally induced experience. Based upon if you're coming at it from a proper orientation or a mistaken identity.
So, through this Samantabhadra aspiration, may everyone become Buddha, manifestly complete in the palace of the Dharma sphere. The underlying basis is non composite. What does that mean? Now? It means when you look, when you were looking at mind, it's not like two things put together. Everything in samsara that we try to concoct or in, in the display is like, ah, this is great. This is even better. Put them together. Wonderful. You know, we concoct, we put, we put it all together. As soon as you put it together, it starts falling apart. Mind is non-composite. No moving parts. And it's ineffable. Meaning, we try to ponder it. We want to understand the mind with the mind. And we develop theories and models, maps. My mind is kind of like a three story layer cake. Yes, I understand it now. Right, you understand your model. Limitless models, maps, theories come into play when mind is not experienced directly as it is in itself. That's why we're so lucky. Because it is self-arisen and a vast expanse in which the labels samsara and nirvana they don't even apply. If just that is known, such is Buddhahood. If not, such is ascension being, drifting through samsara. May every sentient one in the three realms know the ineffable fact, the basis. Everything depends on mind. We can, we can resolve and we can search and we can categorize and classify to the ends of space and beyond. You hold a tape measure out, you can't cover all of it. But if you encounter your mind, everything is experienced by that mind, then you have that one key, you have that special insight, you say, you know the one that can liberate all. Much better than knowing way too much that, that can't bring you genuine happiness. I, Samantabhadra, innately know at its basis the basic fact, void of cause or condition, not flawed by outward inflation or inward detraction, nor covered by the dark veil of unconsciousness. Hence, self-appearances have not been tainted by faults. When reflexive, clear awareness abides in place, that is what we're doing. You just recognize that awareness and you let it abide. Even if the three realms of existence were to be dissolved, there's no panic or attachment to the five desirables. In self-arisen, thought-free consciousness, neither substantial forms nor the five poisons exist. 
Awareness is unencumbered clarity has one essence with five wisdoms. From their maturation, the primal Buddha's five families emerge. As the wisdoms further expand, the 42 Buddhas arose. As the five wisdoms dynamism dawned, the 60 wrathful ones emerged. Hence, basic awareness never became confused, as I am the primal Buddha. Many sentient ones who travel through the three realms recognize self-arisen awareness through this my aspiration. Thus, may great wisdom expand. My emanations are ceaseless. I send forth the inconceivable billions diversely manifest to team whoever by whatever means. Through my compassionate aspiration, may all sentient ones who travel the few realms emerge from the six classes abodes, from the six realms of beings. May they free, be free. At first, since awareness did not dawn upon the basis for confused sentient ones, there was an oblivion, conscious of nothing at all. Just that is the ignorance, confusion's cause. Within that, having fallen senseless through blankness, a disordered consciousness, a panic, started forth. I missed something. From that arose self, other, perceived enemies, through the accretion of ignorance, the base one, you add jealousy and pride. And it's a real nasty brew. The five poisons actions are without cease, driving the mind, compelling the thoughts. Hence, as the basis of sentient ones is confusion is unconscious, ignorance, through the aspiration of myself, the Buddha, may the awareness of all be self-perceived. Co-emergent ignorance is a distracted, unaware mind. The ignorance that assigns labels is to grasp at self and other as two. The two types of ignorance, this co-emergent and ever-labeling, are the basis of the sentient ones is confusion. Through the aspiration of myself, the Buddha, may the enshrouding darkness of every samsaric being's as unconscious be cleared away. May the consciousness that grasps at duality become lucid. May the face of awareness itself be known. The mind of dualistic grasping is doubt. hesitancy, hedging your bets. From the, uh, the arising of a minute clinging, defense imprints have accrued by degrees. One is tormented by the desires that craves the attractive. Food, wealth, clothes, place, friends, five desirables, loving family. Such are worldly confusions. Endless and limitless are the grasping, the actions of this grasping mind at grasp at objects. Once you go for it, it's a never ending. It's like kids playing with the sand castles. It's finished only when you walk away from it. When the fruit of clinging ripens, having been reborn as this hungry ghost, tormented by craving, the sense of, of lack, 
is appalling. Through the aspiration of myself, the Buddha, may all attached and clinging sentient ones neither reject desirous yearning nor fall into adopting this craving attitude, causing awareness to be held in its own place by releasing the mind in its natural state. May all discriminating wisdom be attained. That's the first of the primordial wisdoms. They were saying how the awareness is it's singular, but in it there is primordial wisdoms, which are self arisen. The first of them is all discriminating, like a discernment. That, that awareness which is present always can choose, can know the right choice, can know the right path, naturally. A subtle consciousness dreading appearances that are outer objects starts forth. Through the accretion of aggression, imprints perceived like enemies, gross, striking, killing, has arisen. When the fruit of aggression ripens, how miserable is this realm of hell, burning, freezing. Through the aspiration of myself, the Buddha, when intense aggression has arisen, in every sentient one among the six wayfarers, it should be released in the natural state, without rejecting or adopting it, not pushing away, not angry, not hating the haters, not hating your own hatred, and certainly not believing it has anything to do with reality, but letting it go. This causes awareness to be held in its own place. And the luminous wisdom, mirror-like wisdom, is attained. That's the second primordial wisdom. An inflated attitude is a mind that demeans others, competes with others. Through the arising of a mind of intense pride, suffering of conflict among self and others is never going to be experienced. When the fruit of such action ripens, sentient ones in whom conceit has arisen, they should release mind into its natural state, causing the awareness to be held, into, held in its own place, and this fact of equality, equanimity, is realized. Through the imprints accrued by dualistic grasping, painful self-praise and demeaning of others leads to this accretion of conflict and competition from which one is born as a not quite a god, not quite a deity abode of struggling and fighting. From the fighting, the fruit, the karma, is to fall to more aggressive cycles, vicious cycles. Through the aspiration of myself, the Buddha, you in whom competition and conflict have arisen, release them in the natural state without perceiving others as enemies, causing the mind to be held in its own ground. May there be the wisdom of unimpeded activity. Through unconsciousness, apathy, distraction, through being dense, dull, forgetful, through laziness, delusion, and falling senseless, one will know the fruit to be reborn and to roam around in the animal realm. Through the aspiration of myself, the Buddha made the radiance of clear recollection dawn upon one depressed in the delusion. Thus, may the non-conceptual 
wisdom be attained. Every sentient being in the three realms is equal to myself, the Buddha, the underlying basis of all. Yet, that basis has become the ground for confusion and unconscious. Now you pursue pointless actions. The six actions are like a confused dream. I am the primal Buddha through emanations that tame the six types of wayfarers. Thus, Samantabhadra's aspiration through this, may every sentient one without exception become Buddha in the Dharma sphere. It's in there. There's a Samantha Bhajra. This is the mantra of Samantha Bhajra. So just repeat after me. Aha. 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 Shasama. Aha. Aha. Shasama. Shasama. Aha, 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 shasama. This is the mantra of Samantha Bhajra. And um, I want to dedicate the merit while we're in this beautiful space. And we're bringing, bringing into here, bringing into our mind all of the appearances of the beings who suffer and wherever this type of energy of compassion and uh, the spontaneous service, selfless service can, can be most effective. We imagine it going there, visualize it going there, bringing pacification when there's conflict, bringing enrichment, and when there's poverty, bringing enrichment, abundance. Restoring health, and that's needed. Ultimately, the vision of bringing all the beings to the perfect awakening. find people like that? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's pretty pervasive. But teaching them Buddhism is not the correct way because to teach Buddhism they have to come to you three times 
first, and there's that general idea of not right. right, right. Just yeah, but but you can you can also offer um, just your own shanti, for being peaceful around them, and you're seeing, wow, that's kind of happier way to go. Then you don't even have to call it for Disney. It's just your what you're doing, what you're up to. So you're just out peaceful. Mm -hmm. Teach by reading. Yeah. Yeah. saw how peaceful and happy he was and mm -hmm. I don't have what he's had. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I'm so grateful. I saw your wonderful wife walking with Bodhi the day after you guys got back. I like I just stopped my car in the middle of the road and I was like <laughs> she came up to the car and we were waiting and I was like wow <laughs> right here. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> This new burger. I have like an amazing like burger. I will share. <laughs> if y'all come over to the potluck tomorrow night in Happy Corner, mm. cool. time. Uh, we sat inside, but I was thinking like seven. I need to add a blessing to see what he's free. We can try my potluck burgers. Happy Corner is like next to where you. Yeah. It's like by the Dorothy Johnson Center. Uh -huh. where Bubba lives. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in uh, Ashland, but maybe he's back. Uh, he, he's back. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My daughter called him for it. Oh, yeah? But it doesn't matter. <laughs> Let it go. Cool. Yeah. You have a written version of that prayer or a link to it on that? Absolutely. Does anyone have a, um electronic device? Bring them. Like a cell phone me? Just yeah. can put it on the event page. I have this I have this idea for for teaching um, about animation. I'm gonna do a little tangent on this. We'll get it we'll get you all a text. And then the riff is how in um, Hinayana the emanation, the principle of emanation is not fully understood. Um, even denied. And I have a, this is a wacky, this is my own Kadak theory, okay? It's a very ancient school. The Hinayana goes right back to and doesn't differ from the teaching of the Buddha 2,000 years ago. It was before printed. The original Hinayana was an oral tradition. That's how I heard it. And they, were, they would recite the whole sutra. And books were pretty darn precious. Like they would write them out. And then you had to have someone else write it out. You know, if you were like to go to see where the sutras are collected, it was it was nature. 
um, Ha Shang, who came from China, or over the Himalayas into India, he brought back like these huge loads of sutras. Couldn't get them, you know. And it was just like, if you wanted that knowledge, you had to go to that book. So, the, the image, in a way, of Buddha being a man who woke up to the truth, it, it works. It very much inspires us. Pamasambhava, in his life right before coming to Tibet, he was the son of a poultry woman, a poultry farmer lady, single mom, raising four kids, who had a brilliant idea to build a stupa. She's like in this, this holy land of Nepal, where Buddha was born. And she took it upon herself to build a stupa. And of course the sons did a lot of the work. This is the stupa you can visit in Bodha, outside of Kathmandu. The merit from the, the creation of that stupa was what brought, well, how Padmasambhava had this merit to bring Buddhism to Tibet. In one generation, transforming a warlike, barbaric, somewhat fractured kingdom into this like enlightenment machine, you know, a, a Buddha factory. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this, there's this juxtaposition of, oh, you've got the Samantabhadra essence. It's within all beings, and it's effortless. You can't improve it if you read every self-improvement book at Barnes & Noble's, the whole section on self-improvement. You couldn't make your own Buddha nature any better. No. Similarly, all your screw-ups in samsara, no matter how twisted you get, it doesn't diminish it. It doesn't tarnish it. One wick, one bit. That's the good news. But, for people like me, it just makes me terribly lazy. I have this wonderful Buddha nature, you know. The earlier, the Hinayana style is, there was a man, you know, he brought it upon himself to solve the problem of human suffering. And he did. And you can go and visit that tree. And he sat up there. Damn, I want to take y'all there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you can't. Yeah. Hinayama does refutes the idea of animation, emanations. Yeah. Can you... Elaborate on that just a tad. Right. I, I'm trying to think emanation. I, I think I know what that word means. I didn't know. I couldn't I couldn't grapple, you know, about what emanation is. And then tonight I was I had this text on this device and I wanted to get it on this one and I hooked the Bluetooth up and bam, there it was. I'm gonna send you an email of this text, boom, oh, you have it. What is emanation? Check it out. In the Hinayana, we said, in the Hinayana ancient times, you had to go to that book physically. When, before it was a book, you had to go to that master who held that oral lineage. It was like one to one to one to one. That's not emanation, whatever it's called. You have one and it Boom, it immediately broadcasts to many. That's touching on emanation. And I'm realizing why the, the term is, why Tantra is this age. We live in the age of emanation. You know, every website that you visit, that's how we think about it. You know, when I'm in cyberspace, like, visit this online. What are you visiting? 
it's, it's code that's held in one place, and your browser recreates it for you, you know, on your screen, and you're kind of emanating. You're emanating there, it's emanating to you. All of that is a bit more and more like emanation. So to this day, to this day in the Hinayana tradition, it's strictly one-to-one? -one? No, 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 obviously not. Obviously not. But the, um, we're talking about the philosophical underpinning, the view, is still very much like there was a man, you know, he was a born human, and then he had this enlightenment experience. So an example is is Vipassana, the Hinayana tradition? Absolutely. And it's also in Mahayana tradition and it's also very, very important in Vajrayana tradition. It's it's part of the the stages of meditation. You can't pass it up. There are the the, the uh, shamatha, calm abiding. And the Vipassana, the insight, you know, it's a cornerstone technique. So the word incarnation or avatar right. is a form of emanation. That's right. When it appears yeah. here or the Buddha comes to you in a vision, that's right. an emanation. Right. So they say this master visited me and simultaneously was how he's on this side of the world, he visited the eminent, different emanations of the master. That's right. The copy. <laughs> yeah, that's our that's our modern way of understanding it, but it's limited too. Yeah. It's not the whole story. Thank you. There's this idea that um, when you work with something in your life and you understand it, your your eyebrows are entangled with the ancient ones. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting bigger. Does that mean I shouldn't pluck them? No, no. <laughs> I'm still going to pluck them. <laughs> and then to that, when they meet, they, they go like that, go forehead to forehead. Mm -hmm. 